I'm very happy to um, introduce you Tom Gilbert. Uh, Tom is a professor at the University of Copenhagen. Uh, he's the director of the Center for Evolutionary Hologenomics and uh, a visionary, a thinker, uh, interested in many different systems uh, around the holo, the holo bion and the holo genome. And uh, I promise you an exciting and inspiring talk. Uh, Tom, the stage is yours. Thank you. And thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, I've actually been terrified for about six months about giving this talk, to be honest, because uh, normally when I give a talk, I talk to people who don't believe in the hologenome and the holobiont, which is most of our colleagues. The young people here won't realize this, but most of the old people in biology think it's heresy. So it's rare, if ever, I've had to talk to an audience who could be viewed as converts. And uh, I was mentioning this to Thomas earlier. So normally I'm like the missionary going to the heathens and preaching and possibly they'll try and eat me or burn me or something. Today I'm kind of like the Pope maybe preaching to the, the masses, which could be good. Maybe it'll be like hallelujah. Or maybe you'll be rolling your eyes because you think it's a load of rubbish, but we shall see. Uh, and for the record, uh, I'm, uh, I am based in Denmark. I am a Dane now. I didn't used to be a Dane. I run the uh, Center for Evolutionary Hologenomics, which is a center that was funded uh, to start in 2020, very much actually in light of the fact that, that your issue here was funded, because I could go to the funder and say, this is not crazy. Look, the Germans are funding it. And there's nothing Denmark likes funding more than stuff that Germany's funding. <laughs> Not least because, of course, Kiel is a Danish university, I've been told many times. It's like Denmark's second or third university. So basically, we are the poor copy of your initiative in Kiel, in Copenhagen. Um, yeah, and, and also, for the record, I am an organismal biologist. I uh, studied biological sciences at Oxford, which... Uh, is very weirdly a Bachelor of the Arts degree at Oxford still. But I studied biology, and actually, I'm actually mostly a molecular biologist, even worse. I'm actually particularly bad at organismal biology. I'm not a bacteriologist, not a microbiologist by training. A lot of what I worked on for most of my career was classic organismal biology. Microbes didn't feature in there. I, I did a lot of work on ancient DNA, developing ancient DNA techniques, doing systematics and population genetics and so on. Done a lot of work on birds, I do like my birds. And I've done a lot of work on domestication, in particular in the ancient DNA context, although focusing on the organism. The microbes, if ever they surface, they surface because when you work with ancient DNA, a lot of the DNA you get is microbial DNA, not what you want, and it's a pain in the ass. But then things changed. 2006, we actually got money as the 454 was released, the original 454 that became the, uh, the, the GS Flex. We got money in Copenhagen to get one. I apparently loved it so much, I had a photo shoot with it. I have no memory of this. But I, I wanted to find a picture of what was going on back then. And I, you know, because I'm a molecular biologist, this machine came out and I was like, yes, I want to get this and see what it does. And actually, the problem in 2006 was it was extremely expensive. Those who are old enough to remember this will remember that you for thousands of dollars, you got 20 whole megabase of data, right? And it, it made life difficult unless you were working on humans or pigs or something very money-based. But, say, I've been around long enough to see the technologies change and, more importantly, to see the money bag get cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. And today, your regular field biologist, which I occasionally am, can take a relatively small amount of money and apply it to stuff. And, of course, because this was happening and it was getting about feasible, really, to do stuff financially by about 2010-11, I fully bought into what most of the world believe, which is the genome will answer everything. And I mean the genome of the big thing you can see. I mean, this is actually a, a cover of a recent nature. A lot of people still believe this. The answer is in the genome. And much of what I did was about this. So questions I was applying sequencing to were things like this. How does X eat Y for some reason? How does a, a vulture manage to eat nasty, rotting carcass full of nasty, rotting bacteria? The answer must have been in the genome, I thought, right? And in fact, about 2000 and something, this paper came out by, by a group in Korea. They sequenced the genome of the vulture. They found genetic adaptations that allow the explanation of what's going on and fulfilling my, my idea that the genome is, is, is the answer to what's going on here. Another classic question I've uh, been interested in, why are there so many of certain groups of animals and not so many of the others? This is a phylogeny of the, uh, the birds. It's basically representing the different orders of the birds. 
One of the things about the birds, about 65 to 70% of the birds are the passerines. Why is it they are so successful and not the other 40 or so orders? To me, the answer must have lied in the genome. And actually, this paper came out very recently by, by a group, and they've sequenced or they've analyzed the genomes of birds that actually we sequenced. And they've done various comparative analyses of, of the land birds, which are the very successful group, and they argue that there are adaptations based upon genes related to diet and vision and hearing, and that explains what gives them this adaptive capacity. And here's another one. This is actually work that, that, that I did for many years with a postdoc called Andy Foote. Andy is a killer whale guy. I think they're called orcas today. Killer whale is no longer a PC name. And Andy was actually studying sympatric speciation in action. He was studying killer whales from up off the west coast of California. And these killer whales do seem to be diverging from each other while living in the same environment, in the same habitat, which is strange, classic sympatric speciation. And, and Andy wanted to know what was going on, so we sequenced the genomes of lots of killer whales, and we actually identified various mechanisms causing them to diverge, or at least derive from them diverging, and in fact coined a, a term called genome culture coevolution. But the point was we were 100% convinced the argument was answered using the genome, and that, that was that. And one other last option, uh, sorry, ex um, example, because I'm very interested in this domestication. Those that know your evolution know that domestication is very, very central to, uh, to the thoughts that arose about evolution. Originally, Darwin looked at things being domesticated and sort of his ideas started forming. And there's, of course, been a huge amount of work on the genetics and genomics of domestication. It kind of started early on when people like Shastin Limblad, who's a real pioneer in genomics, sequenced the dog genome for the first time and and she could compare the genome of the dog and the wolf to, to ask questions such as how did X become Y, how did the wolf become the dog? And, and to be fair to the genomics people, some of the answers they get can only be answered by the genome by looking at basically the genomic differences between them. You can actually come up with good models of the process, what was going on, the fact there have been bottlenecks and so on, and it's very hard to do that any other way. But many of the other insights they found were, again, classic genomic ones. So here's a paper by uh, Eric Axelson, who was a colleague of mine for many years. They were comparing the genomes of dogs and wolves to basically answer the question, how do dogs evolve to eat starch-rich diets, which is not a very wolf-like thing. Wolves don't normally eat starch unless they scare a hunter and eat their sandwich or something. And what they'd actually managed to see was that the amylase gene, which of course is very important for digesting starch, has had a massive copy number expansion in dogs. Basically, this just shows lots of copies of amylase in dogs, and it's not expanded in wolves, and therefore, this is the answer. This amylase copy expansion allowed dogs to start eating this diet that they got when they lived with humans. And last example, I thought I had done it, but one more, just to show an ancient DNA example. I've, I've worked on maize for a long time, in particular, the ancient remains of maize. And one of the questions we were interested in was, as maize was first domesticated in hot tropical lowland Mexico, and then it was spread with humans up, being taken to higher altitudes, cooler altitudes, drier altitudes, what happened to it? And actually by sequencing the genomes of ancient maize samples, you can not only look at what genetic changes are happening through time, but you can also see that a lot of the adaptations happening were coming because of introgression into ancient maize coming from wild teosintes, and this is a very common feature of domestication. Typically as domesticates are moved into new ranges, they're crossed deliberately or not deliberately with, with wild variants that live there and they get genetic variation. And that answers the question, so all was good. And I do want to make it very clear, I do believe very much in genomes. I've been very active in the, uh, the Earth Bio Genome Project and its various spin-offs and I even run a whole genome sequencing project in Copenhagen where we do reference genomes. And for at least 13 years now, myself and Goji Zhang have been running B10K, sequencing as many bird genomes as we can get our hands on. If anybody here works on birds, we now have 5,000 de novo reference bird genomes. We have 6,500 samples. We're missing 4,000. So if you have bird samples, or if you want bird genomes, please do talk to me, because we give all our data away, and we take samples and do genomes for free. So genomes are important. Don't get me wrong. I wasn't completely wrong. But my life took a very radical turn back in 2013 when I was doing genomes, because I met Gary. Gary is the bird curator in the Smithsonian. And Gary actually introduced me to vultures, which became a, a love of mine later. And he introduced me by basically starting the conversation by going, Tom, do you know how vultures eat rotting carcasses? And I was like, no. And Gary said, well, despite what they look like, they have very weak beaks and very weak claws, and they can't just open a carcass. 
They have to stick their head up the anus and rip it apart from the inside, which was kind of shocking to hear uh, over dinner as we were eating at that point. But, but the point is that they stick their head up inside the rotting carcass full of all sorts of nasty rotting stuff, right? And so Gary's like, have you ever thought about it? And I said, no, but I bet the answer's in the genome, Gary. And of course, this genome paper came out. And Gary said it might be, but I'm not interested in genomes. Gary said, I'm interested in what are the microbes that end up covering the vulture when it's doing this for a hobby, right? What's the kind of natural skin microbes and gut microbes? And that kind of sounded fun, but I knew nothing about microbiology. So I actually talked to my colleague, Lars Hespier, who was a microbiologist who had a willing PhD student, and I was introduced to the magic of metabarcoding. And I mean here metabarcoding for bacteria. Jumping a long way back in time, we actually invented metabarcoding in a whole other context for eDNA, but I'd never done it on microbes. And so we did this 16S study back in 2012, 13 originally. We sequenced using metabarcoding the microbes of two vulture species on the skin of the face and in the hindgut, and we made pie charts, because that's what everyone makes with this kind of stuff. And the interesting thing was there was a lot of this green and purple, a lot of Clostridia and Fusobacteria, which I didn't know much about. But when I said to Lars, like, what is this stuff? And he's like, the kind of stuff you get gas gangrene from and the kind of stuff you find in rotting carcasses. So no real surprise that the vulture that spends its life bathing in rotting carcass is eating it and covering it. But the cool thing was we did have some zoo turkey vultures who've sadly never enjoyed bathing in rotting carcass. They, they're fed fresh chicken or giraffe or whatever the zoo's feeding them at the time. They were born from vultures that have never bathed in carcasses, and they were born from vultures that were never bathed in carcasses. And the faces and the gut of them are full of these rotten carcass microbes, right? Now, this was the first time for me I got really interested in microbes, because I was like, that's weird. Why would these rotten carcass microbes be living on the vulture when they're not doing the job? And of course, if you're trained in evolution, you tend to think when you see something like that, there's got to be an explanation. So Liz Zapeda, who was my uh, most computational PhD student at the time, begged to do some shotgun metagenomics, and we, we, did, we, we did shotgun metagenomics, and she crunched all the data, and to cut a long story short, she basically found that on the face and in the gut, there are bacteria that at least have the functions, if they wish to use them, to do various things. So for example, there is this fusobacterium that basically is uh, metabolizing butanoate, I think, and there is a... She looked at that and read into it a bit and said, this is the kind of stuff which is known to have antimicrobial activities. So maybe it's maintaining this bacteria because it's producing antimicrobial agents to take out other nasty pathogens. We couldn't prove it because it's only based on mags, but you know, she said, look, there could be a mechanism there. And she looked in the gut and she saw, saw some other things and she said that they're producing things which are associated with biofilms and maybe it makes sense to maintain these bacteria to make a biofilm to protect the gut from the nasty stuff coming in. And she was basically arguing to me, look, I think these microbes are being maintained because they're doing useful stuff for the host. And again, this is going to sound maybe stupid to a lot of people here because maybe you're trained in the School of Microbiology, but for an organismal biologist, I was like, that is pretty weird. And of course, what we were basically seeing is what is now being termed, and to be fair, has been termed on and off since the 1940s, a holobiotic basis of adaptation to rotting carcass. The question how does the vulture adapt to bathing in rotten carcass can only be answered through both the genes of the vulture and the genes of certain microbes. And without both parts, we don't have the full picture. And this, of course, is when the light bulb went off in my head and I was like, damn, you know, we're missing the point. We're focusing all on one part, ignoring the other point, being very confident, writing covers to nature about how we've got the solution and probably getting a lot of it wrong. At best, partially correct, at worst, completely wrong. So again, this was all back in about 2014, 2015. And of course, microbes being important to animals and plants has been known for a long time. I mean, we, we know they're important in the gut for digesting things. We know they're important in cows for making methane. We are, there's a huge industry today making probiotics for chicken and plants and dog additives. And, and of course, there's all sorts of interesting stuff coming out about the ways microbes can affect human health beyond simply making you classically sick, for example, arthritis and so on. And, and this is all going on and it's fine, but again, I'm an evolutionary biologist. I don't tend to be very interested in this. But when we were having these, well, when I was having these revelations that there was more going on than I'd been counting for in the genome, this was the time all sorts of other studies started coming out, including driven by people like Kevin, who is here, who will be talking about this kind of stuff later in the week, where people were studying the microbiomes in various animals, vertebrates, the kind of things I look at, and seeing the microbes 
conferring on the animals all sorts of properties that are way beyond regular diet and health, right? So sure, that they affect nutrition is not a surprise, but Kevin's got a super nice study showing that they give toxicity resistant. They allow these neotoma wood rats, wood rats to eat stuff they couldn't normally do. There is a, this famous study out of a group in Sweden where they've actually taken brown bears and they've actually compared the microbiome of them when they're awake and when they're hibernating and they find differences and then they even manipulate mice with the microbes and sort of um, start early stage hibernation. There are studies on thermoregulation, there are studies on behavior. There are studies on all these kind of properties which are kind of important for the lives of animals and they're super important if you're interested in adaptation. This slide, for the record, is something Charles Darwin never said, but whoever said this said it better than Charles Darwin, right? But when you think about evolution, there is this idea that the strongest doesn't survive, nor the more intelligent, but the one most responsive to change, right? It's this idea adaptation is key. Said Charles Darwin didn't write it. He didn't write it in 1809 when he was zero years old either. I did research into this. It was written by a business studies professor called Leon C. Meganson, who liked to quote Darwin a lot. But he did a much better job than the original Darwin quotation. Don't even try and read it, but it's very long and rambly, but it gets to the same point, right? Adaptation is key. And we have to bear this in mind if we're interested in evolution. If adaptation is key, what is the key driver of adaptation? What's the most effective driver of adaptation? Is it the genome or is it something else? And based upon this, we actually wrote this little opinion piece, myself and my colleagues, arguing maybe we're kind of missing the point. Maybe it's the gut microbiomes of vertebrates that are giving these adaptive kicks that you need in order to adapt rapidly, and the genome's a kind of secondary effect that maybe gets in later. Why is it that microbes might be so important for adaptation of animals and plants? Well, it's basically about time. If we think about the classic mindset of the geneticists thinking about the host genome, and you ask them, how does something adapt in light of changing environments? Well, the answer is, if it's within the lifetime of the individual, you can change gene expression, you can turn genes on or turn them off or change the amount of things. But ultimately, to really make the changes, you've got to have babies. You've got to find yourself a partner, you've got to mix the DNA of the two parents, make babies and so on, and hopefully you make a combination that's a good combination. And this can be a relatively fast process in rapidly reproducing animals, it can be a very slow process in slowly reproducing animals like humans and whales and, uh, and so on. And of course, the beauty of the microbiome, as I'm sure everyone realizes, is that we can change it so fast. So if the microbes are conferring properties, and given you can switch your microbiome extremely rapidly by changing your diet or so on, you can introduce these adaptive properties so fast, and therefore it must be a much more important thing for rapid adaptation. So in light of this, then, what I started thinking about was, if I go back to these questions that, that used to obsess me that I thought we'd solved using genomes, I wonder if there's a better explanation. And what I will do now is give you my alternative explanation based upon microbes. A lot of people hate these ideas. Uh, luckily, I sit at the top of the food chain in Denmark and I can have the ideas, but uh, <laughs> junior people can't have the ideas. Uh, funding panels typically hate these ideas, but I'll present them and you can decide for yourself is it plausible, is it not, is it complete rubbish, and so on. So we'll start with domestication, right? So if we think about domestication and microbes, there are some sort of key questions one might want to ask oneself. Firstly, do microbes change at all as a species is domesticated? If they do, can they have functional effects? And might these microbes even be relevant to the initial domestication process itself? Could we do domestication without the microbes? Could these microbes even determine which species we actually domesticate? So, obviously the fact that microbes change during domestication is non-surprising, as was made very clear in talks earlier today, and as I think everybody knows, microbes are incredibly sensitive to the diet and the environment. This is just a summary figure from a human study. Only point to take away is, of course, you change your diet, you have a big effect on the microbiome. And of course, one of the first things that happens when you domesticate things is they get a new diet, because they start scavenging off human waste as opposed to eating whatever they eat normally. So no big surprise the microbiome will change during domestication. But is it more than just that? And there is actually quite a bit of evidence now that the answer is yes. So here's actually a study I ran into just a few weeks ago that I found quite interesting. This is a study from Virginia Tech. And at Virginia Tech, they've been working with some chicken that they've been selecting on for 56 generations to become very, very tiny or very, very large. This is really quite a crazy, crazy size difference. 
And they've been studying these in a hologenomic way. They've been studying the genomes of these and the microbiomes of them, and they've been finding some interesting stuff. So what they did was they, they dissected out the guts of their chickens. Here is a chicken gut for those of you that like that kind of stuff. They then profiled the microbes at different parts of the gut, and they've done some basic analyses. So what you see, for example, the high weight line, which is in red, always has a higher microbial diversity than the low weight line. It doesn't matter where you look. So, you know, something's interesting. Bear in mind these things are raised in the same facility, fed the same food. Everything is equal apart from the fact that somehow in their body there is selection on which microbes are there. They actually go beyond just which microbes are there. They basically look at the functions of the microbes. And what this figure is basically showing is differences in the mean proportions of various functions encoded by the, the microbes. And the takeaway is there are differences. Because they've sequenced the genome and the epigenome as well, and the transcriptome to some degree, they can even make nice interaction networks where they can identify variation in the genome of the chicken and how that actually affects which microbes are present. And in doing so, basically what the paper is showing, and this is not the first time this has been shown, but it shows very nicely. Firstly, the growth of the chicken is conditioned by the hollow genome. It needs both the genome and the microbiome together to be affecting to get that phenotype, and it's a very fast trait but also that the microbiome is being shaped by the host genome. So clearly, this one artificial situation, it's all about the holobiont, and the genome is not enough to explain what's going on. But what about other traits? I mean, growth is kind of about nutrition, and nutrition is kind of about microbes, and it kind of makes sense. So domestication is a very interesting trait. Sorry, within domestication, there is a very interesting trait, which is tameness. Tameness is like the one universal trait. What this figure basically shows is a load of domestic animals, uh, a load of traits that domestic animals have, and if they basically have it or not. If they have it, there's a green X, and if they don't, they don't. And the main point is there is like one trait shared by everything, and that is tameness. And it's true. Tameness is like fundamental to getting animals to, to live with us, or at least cuddly animals, maybe not goldfish, I don't know. So. Of course, this has been studied for a very long time at the, the genetic front, and genomic studies have been done studying what are the kind of things that make the domestic animal differ. And for example, in dogs versus wolves, there's selection on a gene called MBP. In, uh, in horses, it's ZFMP1. And, and in domestic foxes, which we'll come back to later, it's this saw CS1 gene. And all of these genes are known to be important in behavior and fear and this kind of stuff. And it makes kind of sense that they've been selected on, and they explain what's going on. But the problem with all this is what we're seeing here is the result of a long time selection domestication. Wolves started to be domesticated 25,000 years ago. And sure, 25,000 years later, we have all these changes in the genome that explain what's going on. But what I think people tend to ignore is the challenge of the early domestication, because, you know, fine, we originally had wolves. Wolves are aggressive, nasty things. You can't live near them. Today, we have these dogs that are fully adapted and their genome is changed. Yes, that took 25,000 years. But what about the first one, two, three, five, 10, 15 generations of time? How did humans live alongside the wolf before it picked up all these changes that turned it into something lovable and cuddly and slightly embarrassed, like my dog in her nappy? Um, but uh, you know, very rarely do people discuss this point, right? They kind of assume the wolves and the humans came together and bingo, next generation, we had a dog, which is just nonsensical, right? But that is the standard dogma in what's going on. So we need some kind of explanation for how we affect this. And this is a classic one where it makes much more sense to me that it's about the microbiome, given what we know today about the famous gut-brain axis, which I'm pretty sure everyone here knows about, but the idea that your little microbes are factories in the gut pumping out chemicals that go up and affect the brain and affect the behavior and get affected back from the brain. So can this be tested? Well, this is the kind of stuff that can be tested to see if it's plausible. So Lara here was one of our PhD students, and Lara worked with a load of chicken that were created by a guy called Per Jensen at Linköping University in, in, in uh, Sweden. And Per got hold of red jungle fowl, uh, and he selected on them for a number of generations to make them more aggressive and also more tame. So like basically more chicken-like and less chicken-like. And he found it went quite fast. He studied the behavior. He um, sequenced the genomes and the epigenomes and saw there were changes in transcription going on and so on and so on. But what Lara did was she studied the microbiomes of these. And the really important point about this kind of study is, again, these chickens are raised in one facility 
on the same food, they live together, they're not even in separate pens, right? So the environment is completely standardized. And what Lara wanted to see was, do we get differences in the microbiome despite this homogeneity? And the answer was yes, very, very clearly yes. So basically, they have exactly the same microbes within them, but there are clear differences in the relative abundance of the microbes. And this is actually heritable across generations. So for example, the high fear lines of chickens have got relatively more of these uh, lactobacilli. And while we can't say what they do in chicken, there are studies on things like dogs showing that they're, they're associated with fear uh, in dogs. So interesting observation there. And for example, in the low fear line, there is a, an abundance of Clostridiales, which have been shown in other animal systems like rats to be associated with happiness. So there does appear to be this kind of selection happening on the microbes correlating with behavior. It does raise the question of which way around is it happening. Oh, not again, sorry. Anyway, so going back to the chicken. So, <laughs> so you know, we, we, saw this, we saw this result and, uh, you know, again, Normally, when you see differences between these kind of things, what somebody will say was, well, of course there's a difference because fearful dogs, for example, are fearful because they're treated in a certain way and fed a certain kind of food and so on, and the environment's different. But when you see it in a very controlled situation, it is somewhat harder to explain what's going on. Luckily, I can remember my slides, despite having so many. So what Lara did after this was, she actually said, well, okay, this is one system, it's chicken. What else is there out there? What's more closely related to dogs, which is the system we care about. And at this point, we got hold of samples from the Believ foxes. And I don't know how many of you have ever heard of the Believ foxes. Believ was a researcher in the Soviet Union in the 50s in Novosibirsk. He actually got hold of foxes from fur farms in the Baltics. And these foxes were acclimatized to being in a fur farm, which is already different to being wild. So they were, you could argue they were semi-domesticated. But he got these foxes and he brought them in and he did the same kind of experiment on the foxes. He basically, every generation, looked at the baby foxes, scored them on some kind of measure of tameness, were they like hissing and trying to bite him or were they kind of licking or so on. Well, there we go. And uh, thank you. Uh, so yeah, so this is Believ. He, he got his foxes and he basically, uh, you know, selected on them. And they're, they're a classic study in domestication. We know that after many, well actually, after only a few generations, they started to diverge in phenotype, but basically, after a number of generations, they ended up with a line, which are these uh, so-called tame ones that you could actually buy until Russia invaded Ukraine, and they, you know, something like five, ten thousand dollars and they're very dog-like. They, they've changed phenotype completely. They're, their voice is different. They, they don't smell like a fox anymore. Their, their tail curves, they've got these patches on and stuff. And then they've got these ones here that you probably could buy to give to somebody you don't like, but they're not very nice. If there was an illegal circuit in fighting foxes, that would be the ones you want. They're, they're really very aggressive stroke fearful, which is not always a different thing. So, so what Lara did was she, she analyzed the, the microbes in these things, and she again, just like the chicken, saw that although these things are raised in a standardized environment, and they're fed the same food, and they're allegedly never handled or anything, there are differences in, in the microbiome. And what she actually, uh, she showed there was, there was differences in the relative abundance. And actually, this is a figure she made. What we have up here are what are called gut-brain modules. These are just basically various properties encoded by microbes that do things that are important for behavior. And these are basically various microbes that are present. And the important thing is if one looks at the, the colors, that kind of shows you where there's a, a significant and kind of reproducible difference. And if you dig into what they are, you find things, for example, like uh, in the, the happy foxes, uh, genes that are there to encode butyrate synthesis. And this is interesting because butyrate synthesis is known in both humans and animals to reduce uh, aggressive behavior, induce calming, which is the kind of thing you would need to make a happy fox. And there's a glutamate degradation, which has been linked to reducing aggression and so on. And interestingly, several of these things are also the kind of things she was seeing in chicken. So there seems to be the same situation happening again, that although they've only been selected on for relatively few generations, there is divergence in the microbiome. So really what is going on seems to be a, a hologenomic angle. And actually the, the, the genomes of these foxes were published a few years ago. And I'd already mentioned this a bit earlier. One of the key differences in the genomes of the fox lines is this receptor for sore CS1, which actually is a, re a receptor that binds to glutamate, right? So we seem to have this, this nice system that the microbes 
are being selected on in the calm line to make this glutamate, and then there's selection in the genome on a receptor for glutamate. It's fitting together very, very, very nicely. It doesn't answer the question of why are there differences in the microbes. We're still seeing an end product, but if you do read the genome paper of the, the fox, it's full of all sorts of genes to do with behavior and the brain and stuff, all this very exciting stuff, and then there is this little half sentence towards the end, and it actually says, you know, we see all these behavioral differences, and then the immune system's different as well, and they leave it at that. But of course, differences in the immune system are probably super important for affecting the microbiome. So my guess would be what happened early in the selection was that these foxes that as kittens in the early generations that showed some kind of variation in behavior actually had differences in the genes in the immune system and that in turn affected the microbes and that in turn affected the behavior and it started this cycle of change. So it could at least be an alternate explanation for how very early in the domestication we changed the behavior of wolves so that we could live alongside them, so that we could select on their genome for enough time to make a dog. So I kind of view it as a kind of drugging, essentially. It does raise the question, how could you do this? How could you drug a wolf? Luckily, wolves are basically dogs, and one thing that all dogs love to do is eat feces. I don't know how many people own dogs here. If my dog runs into the bushes in the park, it's almost certainly found human shit. And given that the model of domestication that we think is most likely is that wolves started to move in closer and closer to humans because they were running out of megafauna to hunt. As wolves moved into humans, they probably started scavenging around human camps. Humans, even back in the Paleolithic, did not crap in single places. They were very, you know, crapping everywhere, probably throwing rubbish everywhere. So it wouldn't be a huge surprise that the wolves and their young in particular would have the ability to feast on human microbes, therefore modify them. It could be a long stretch, but at least the data is consistent that it could be a pathway for what's going on. If this is the case, one can also ask the question, why did we domesticate the wolf and, in fact, not uh, any of the other canids? So, you know, the wolf is one of a group of what we call crown canids that include things like the coyote and the African golden wolf and the golden jackal and the black black jackal and so on. And from the point of view of humans having a useful pet, they would have all been great. We lived alongside most of these in Africa, and these things are good at hunting, they're good at guarding, they're sociable. So one does have to wonder, what was it that, that was the wolf that made us first domesticate it? Was it a technological transition? Did uh, humans 25,000 years ago suddenly think, I've got a good idea, I'm going to domesticate a wolf? Was it environmental, or was it that maybe these other species are just completely untamable? Could it simply be that these other species either don't like to eat feces, or if they do eat feces, they're genetically not compatible with taking the microbes up and being affected by the, 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 uh, the compounds they produce. It may seem like a bit of a long shot, but there are ways you can at least model this. And the way we like to think about it is, is a concept we call microbiome space. And microbiome space is a property which is basically drawn from ecology. And it helps us think about the differences in the microbes that not only do live in an organism, but could live in it. So if you imagine you know all the microbes that, are, that could live in an environment, the environment could be the piece of paper in front of you, it could be the ocean, it could be anything, you could lay them all out in front of you and you could be aware of the potential of them being there or not and you could just draw yourself a nice grid. And in this case, I'm just gonna color in squares. Each square is a microbe and a dark color is the microbes there and very abundant, a light square is it's absent. Now what we like to think about is how does the host genome determine the microbiome space of any individual. So for example, I might right now have a microbiome space that could in theory allow a whole range of microbes. They may not be there because I haven't eaten Danish food for breakfast or I haven't changed my diet or whatever. But the point is microbes from the outside could never be in there. I could never have a cable bacteria living inside me. It doesn't fall in my microbiome space. Now what's inside you will change all the time, but ultimately they are constrained by the space. What we're really very interested in in our center is how does differences in the host genome actually determine the overlap of space between individuals and in fact the differences in space that one individual has and the other one doesn't have. Because these are the kind of things that could be important for evolution and properties. If red individual can have a new microbe living inside it because genetically it's compatible with it and if that microbe can make it super aggressive it can get a new behavior that could be important for evolution. If a green individual could have a microbe that red can't and it allows it to change its diet, that could also be a property that could maybe be useful for, for evolution. 
So basically, going back to this question, why the wolf and why not anything else, maybe simply the answer is that the generic canid microbiome space, as encoded by the generic canid genome, is this. Maybe genetically the wolf is slightly different and can work with some different microbes, and maybe just one of those microbes is one of the ones that affects and change the behavior. This is very, very hard to test right now, but we are trying to work on mechanisms to try and test this kind of thing without doing things that are too unethical. To accept this, you do have to accept the idea that genetics significantly shapes the microbiome, and this has been very controversial for a long time. A lot of people don't like this idea. Obviously, it's, a, it's not even a question at the between species level. I mean, if you just, for example, compare the microbiomes of monogastrix and ruminants and hindgut fermenters, of course they're different because their guts are completely different structures, and of course the structure of the gut shapes the microbe. No big surprise there. If you're a plant person, exactly the same thing. Different root structures will have different microbes simply because the structure is different. The disagreement is about the within species level, intraspecific. And the disagreement has arisen partly because the initial studies were done on things like humans, which are dreadful study sets. I mean, this is just one of the early papers. They were profiling the differences in the microbiomes of different communities. And of course, they're different because they're living in different places and eating different things. And therefore, you can't go much beyond it. Here's a similar example from crops. This is just showing barley, I think, from Israel. And they see that the different barley from different locations has got different microbes. But of course, they're grown in different geography. No big surprise. One of the beauty, though, of course, of lab work, and uh, in particular working on domestics that are very tractable, you can test this directly. So this is a really simple master's study, a master's student project that was done over a, a couple of months. What the student did was he just basically got hold of five different land races of maize. He grew them in the greenhouse on exactly the same soil in the same conditions for uh, three months. He then sequenced the root microbiomes and he just looked at the microbial communities and whether he's looking at, for example, a diversity of the microbes or just looking at them in some kind of PCOA. It's very, very clear that the genome of the land race is selecting on the microbes differently and therefore having an effect. So this is not hard to prove. Whether it's significant is another question. But if this is happening, one can start to then think about questions like this. So these land races we were testing are shown on this map here, basically it's the, uh, as you can see, they're in different uh, distributions of the Americas. And a legitimate question in, in maize biology is why? What's driving this? Is it the uh, genetic variation of the host? And if it is, what is going on? I actually wonder if the answer again lies in the microbiome space. Maybe if one was to think about which microbes these crops can actually work with, as encoded by the genome, if you end up with something like this, that for example, ones that grow in a very, very unique environment are adapted to a very specific cluster of microbes and the ones that grow in other regions that have overlaps have some overlap but some differences. And if you think about things like B73, B73 is like a super maze that will grow everywhere. Maybe what makes it a super maze is that it's able to work with a really, really broad range of microbes and that explains its distribution. And again, one can start thinking about this and applying it to all sorts of other questions. So this question I started at the beginning, passerine diversity, why are 65 to 70% of the birds this one group? Could it simply be that they can work with a much, much wider range of microbes than any other bird, which gives them the ability to basically eat more things or explore new habitats? So maybe there's a relatively narrow diversity of microbes associated with most birds, but maybe the passerine can explore a huge potential within this microbiome space, and this allows them to adapt to all sorts of new diets. This is actually difficult to test. There is data that one can explore. This is data from Sarah Hurd that she published a few years ago. It's basically a principal component analysis of the microbes found in different birds, and they're colored by different orders. The passeriforms are this order that's the very, very dominant one, and you can see they're all over the place. The problem, of course, is that these birds are already eating different things and in different locations. So the ideal situation would be that these birds are raised in the same conditions and tested to see what's going on. That's very hard to do. Another problem is that many of these samples are non-standardized. This is the classic microbiome horror story we all know about, that if somebody else collects samples and treats them in a different way, the data is very uncomparable. In this regard, I do want to briefly flag a project being led by my colleague Anton Alberti. He's pushing this thing called the Earth Hologenome Initiative, where he's trying to collect standardized data across a huge number of um, vertebrates. 
It's a very collaborative project. Uh, they basically ship collection kits to people who do animal work, and they've basically been collecting around the world, and they've got some very beautiful figures on their pages. But at this point, they've received about uh, 6,500 samples from 230 groups for 150 species. And these are fully, fully, fully standardized. And this is key, because if you want to start making these comparisons, you need that standardization. So if anybody is working on vertebrates and is interested in standardized data, Anton is the man to contact. I think my last example I want to go back to is the, the hardest one for many people to accept, which is the sympatric speciation. So again, as I mentioned, these killer whales are very interesting, because although they all live in the same location off the west coast of the US, they do appear to be diverging from each other. They're not having any reproduction with each other. They're forming new species. And it's really hard to explain how this can go on. But one of the interesting things about these is these three types of killer whales that are diverging have got very, very different diets. And they're very specific on what they eat. One of the groups eats fish. One of them eats marine mammals. One of them eats birds. And why is this important? Well, it goes back to this point that has been covered several times today. Diet clearly affects the microbiome. And of course, the microbiome can affect the brain. So what I actually wonder could be going on is, is this initial preference for diet basically affecting in some way the brain through the gut-brain access and leading to reproductive isolation, essentially driving a lack of preference for things that are not eating the same diet? Sounds kind of crazy, but there is a little bit of evidence coming out. I found this uh, paper a, a few years ago about actually diet, gut microbes, and host mate choice. I got very excited until I found it was about Drosophila. But on the other hand, if it works in Drosophila, it may well work in other things as well. So what is all the point of this? Well, essentially, I do believe more and more and more that if you're an evolutionary biologist interested in organisms, you absolutely have to take the microbiome into account because you absolutely will not get the right answer. Otherwise, of course, that's just the evolution. I mean, there's growing evidence that it's the same in medicine. If you want to, for example, treat people with microbiomes, you probably have to take host genetic variation into account. It's got equal relevance for crops and, and domestication and so on. And I really do hope more and more people will embrace this. Uh, Thomas and I had a chat about this earlier, and Thomas is uh, not feeling so positive that the rest of the world will eventually embrace the union of the two. But I hope that that's just the old people who will die because their microbiomes are not good enough. And the young people with the vigorous microbiomes will take it over. So this is why, essentially, I spend a lot of time going around the place and, uh, to paraphrase the Mandalorian, say, this is the way. Stop looking at one or the other. And I've always felt very good about doing this. But on the other hand, I, I've kind of come to the realization when reading the web page of your center that your aim is to understand why and how they enter into the connections and what consequences they have, which is all I'm talking about. So those of you that again know the Mandalorian, you will know he never takes his helmet off. But if he did, it would be Thomas. <laughs> Thomas is the way. So, so thank you, Thomas, because I, I think you're doing a hugely great job for pushing this. And of course, you have your book and so on. But just holding meetings like this, I think, is super, super important and getting people schooled in this thought. The best thing that can happen to me is that everybody here goes, that was really boring because we know all this already, because that shows Thomas has won. Uh, I will say thanks, but I want to end with the last thing. You're not the only guys with a conference. We are holding in Copenhagen a conference next year, three days in June. Um, it's free. It is the Applied Hologenomics Conference. Basically, it is a conference where there is a number of speakers who are coming who work with extremely different tools, state-of-the-art tools, and they are applying them to all sorts of interesting questions. Some of the questions are applied, some are health-related, some are evolutionary, some are conservation and so on. It's basically a place to go if you want to go and actually see what can be done and get ideas. We did do it once before a few years ago. Manuel was a speaker at that one, for example, and it got a lot of uh, interest. There's a very interesting range of speakers coming this time, including Thomas. He's actually, I think, the lead speaker of the lot. So um, please do consider coming. I say it is free. Copenhagen is expensive, I agree, but you can camp. Um, but apart from that, the conference is free. Actually, Connie, I think, used to also be here, and she's one of our speakers. So if you want to know more, we have a website, we have a X account and so on, but please do feel free to come. And with that, thank you. I hope it wasn't too long. <laughs>